Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to be here to speak with you again. I have no uh, disclosures in reference to this presentation. I get to talk to you about my algorithm for subclavian artery intervention. The uh, subclavian artery stenosis, and we're primarily talking about atherosclerotic subclavian artery stenosis. The incidence is about 3 to 4 percent in the general population. Up to about 20 percent of patients with PAD will have subclavian stenosis. And the left subclavian is four times more likely to be involved than the right. And I think this is important when you think about the population of patients that we deal with and the majority of patients being right-handed. That's one of the reasons, uh, although that's a weak reason, but one of the reasons that we often don't make the diagnosis until it's late. The uh, upper extremity symptoms can include claudication, so just combing your hair or brushing your teeth, uh, muscle fatigue, rest pain, and sometimes embolic events occur, and that tells us that there's a, a problem more proximally. There are neurologic issues that are, are typically characterized by vertebral basilar symptoms, and I think most of us are, are very uh, inept when it comes to vertebral basilar symptoms, and uh, there's a lot of confusion with just simple dizziness or what's really vertebral basilar uh, insufficiency. The uh, indications for treatment can be disabling ischemia, claudication. Those are the more obvious ones. Sometimes vertebral bays are insufficiency. Still syndrome in patients that have had other revascularization procedures, be it a lemograph, be it a conduit for bypass or a conduit for uh, dialysis. The uh, treatment in this study from our group, we found that about 57% of the patients had arm ischemia as the etiology for their, uh, for their symptoms or indication for treatment. Vertebral basilar uh, or subclavian steel in about 37% of the patients, coronary subclavian steel in about a fourth of the patients, and then patients that were being planned to have bypass surgery where the lima was going to be harvested as a conduit uh, was the indication for revascularization. And in your institution, it, it may be that the surgeons are reluctant to use the lima after the subclavian's been used or, or after the subclavian has been treated, but we know, um, you know from our experience that treating the subclavian preoperatively makes the uh, lima a very uh, viable conduit. The surgical repair, if we're going to talk about revascularization procedures, then we need to understand what the alternatives are. Uh, the axillary, axillary bypass, carotid subclavian bypass, and then transposition of the subclavian artery. The endovascular repair uh, usually would be PTA, but there have been case reports of using some of the other modalities, including drug-coated balloons, bioresorbable stents. Uh, stenting is probably the most commonly used method for treating these patients, and whether that's a balloon expandable versus a self-expanding stent uh, depends on uh, several factors, uh, primarily the location and the appearance of the stenosis. So I get to tell you about my algorithm. Uh, it's, it begins with an initial evaluation history and symptoms. Uh, often the patients will tell you that they can never get a blood pressure in my left arm. Okay, you have to pay attention to that, so you should try it and see if the patient's really uh, telling the truth. There may be a history of trauma. Uh, if the patient is a cigarette smoker or has coronary artery disease or PAD, then that increases the likelihood of them having subclavian stenosis. So physical examination, you have to have blood pressures recorded in both arms. Okay. In our clinics, patients get blood pressures measured and recorded in both arms, you know, even for a routine clinic visit. This was a patient that had a uh, non-STEMI, was being evaluated for aortic stenosis, was found to have two-vessel coronary artery disease. And what doesn't show up very clearly on that initial aortogram is that there's a tight subclavian stenosis. This patient did not have blood pressures measured in both arms when they went to the laboratory. And in your laboratories where you're doing primarily radio cases, I think it's paramount that you do this because otherwise you'll end up with a patient like this. Uh, this was a patient that had unstable angina. He had post-bypass. He also had PAD. None of this, of course, is told to you before you get the patient in the laboratory. You discover all this while he's on the table, uh, which is 
unfortunately not that uncommon with, uh, in my practice. But what was interesting about this particular patient is that he had unstable angina, he had a non-STEMI, he also had a very high grade proximal subclavian stenosis that was not identified by non-invasive testing or by symptoms prior to him being, coming to the laboratory. And he was also not consented for a peripheral intervention, and so he left the laboratory without having this um, lesion treated. So the next thing is testing. Ultrasound, CTA, angiography, or non-invasive evaluations. And then for the intervention, you choose your access site. Uh, common femoral is the most common access site. Uh, radio artery may be used. You may need to use ultrasound to obtain radio access. And it's rare to use the brachial artery nowadays. Uh, it may require more than one access site. And that is because if you're coming from one of the limb access sites, then you may want to ch or choose to externalize your wire so you can work in an anti-grade fashion. It's easier to position your stent when working in an anti-grade fashion. The, you must consider the, if it's a stenosis versus an occlusion, uh, the location in relation to the other arch vessels, the length and diameter of the vessel, the calcification or lack of calcification. You can use IVUS for quantitative angiography, um, or, and you can also use what's called REO cranial angulation to um, determine the extent of the lesion. So you can predilate, and I always choose to predilate. Uh, remember, you don't have to be one to one with your predilatation. You can always make it bigger, you can't make it smaller. You choose your stent appropriately, uh, you may need to post dilate. And if you're using IVUS, you can use IVUS for follow-up, and you can also measure pressure gradients. This is an um, image of a patient that I did years ago with uh, sort of diffuse proximal subclavian stenosis on the right and left-hand panel. On the upper right or upper left-hand panel, you see a reference object. This is what we use to perform quantitative angiography. Uh, the balloon dilatation, and after balloon dilatation, a stent is placed. The stent is deployed, and if the stent is not adequately deployed, you can ex upsize with the larger balloon. And then the final angiography on the lower right-hand panel. Finally, this is a patient I saw in the clinic that was referred to me after having been seen by neurology, by a non-invasive adult congenital physician, and presented with a history that had some components that were compatible with vertebral basilar disease. Uh, she was referred to me for intervention, and uh, we elected to get a CTA, which demonstrated a dissection of her right vertebral artery and occlusion of her left subclavian artery. I referred her to the vascular surgeon for a carotid subclavian bypass because I was concerned about the proximity of the left vertebral which was the only remaining posterior circulation that she had in the presence of a dissection in the right vertebral. So this was a case that I could do and potentially be a hero, or this is a case that I could do and feel very bad that I take a 23-year-old female who could have a very simple carotid subclavian operation with a good outcome as opposed to trying to put a stent in just to prove that I could do it. I was not sure of the, uh, what had happened with the uh, carotid or with the subclavian when she had her surgery. She had a, a patch for a tetralogy of flow repair, and so it was questionable whether the subclavian was even there or not. So in summary, take an appropriate history and physical, uh, non-invasive testing, indications for treatment have to be there, and endovascular first, but not always. Thank you very much. Thank you.